So if you could speak to that a bit, like our long history with fire, sure. maybe fire's relationship with the planet in general. Yeah. Sure. Well, well, fire has been around since terrestrial life. Uh, life in the oceans created oxygen, gave us an oxygenated atmosphere. Uh, life on land gave us combustibles, stuff to burn. Um, the one thing, life, uh, the, the chemistry of fire is essentially a biochemistry. It takes apart what photosynthesis puts together. And when it occurs in our cells, we call it respiration. When it occurs, the same, same reaction occurs out in the wide world, we call it fire. So it's really fundamental. It's, it's uh, a creation of the living world. Uh, and it's been around. We have fossil charcoal from fires dating 420 million years ago. So uh, it's, it's, it's been there for a long time. But it's always had – it organizes itself in uh, various ways. And the big change is when a species arrived who could control ignition. And that that really begins with the hominins. And uh, before, even before uh, the sapiens came on the scene. So it's, it's really part of our heritage as a species. But we got, you know, small guts and big heads uh, because we learned to cook food. And then we went to the top of the food chain because we learned to cook landscapes. And now we've become a geologic force because we begin to cook the planet. So we 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 were a pretty uh, fire is pretty fundamental for us, as you point out. It's in our genome. I mean, there are a lot of studies that point out we we can't live in the sense of being able to reproduce and survive on raw food alone. We need the added uh, boost that uh, cooking uh, brings. Um, we we now overprocess our food, so that's a problem. But we had to be able to process it at some point, to, so we didn't have enormous guts and giant uh, mandibles uh, and small and small skulls to you know to hold the uh, to hold the muscles to work the mandibles. So we could we could chew and process it easier. So all of that that so that's in our genome. And then we began, you know, extending the process across landscapes. Uh, we, we've always burned deliberately and, and accidentally. And that, you know, that, that kind of goes to the operating system of a lot of ecosystems. And you can really change things uh, if it's already burning or if it's prone to burn but doesn't have a regular ignition source. Well, now, now it does. If it's prone to burn, you can preemptively burn. You can redirect that whole system. And like a lot of Mediterranean climates don't have a lot of lightning, certainly not dry lightning, um, but they're, they're, they're perfectly situated climatically to burn because they go through wetting and drying. So it's wet enough to grow stuff, dry enough to allow it to burn, and people can put ignition into that system and then pretty much take control of it. So... Paradoxically, given today's circumstances, we thrived where we could use fire because that was our power. That's that's sort of our ecological signature. That we have a species monopoly over it now. We it's what we do that no other species does. You know, other uh, other creatures knock over trees and dig holes in the ground. We do fire. But there were always, and we you know we could do a lot just by ignition controlling the timing and placing of ignition and we can we we can prevent places from foresting uh, a lot of what uh what steps uh the sour felt in in uh, africa the the eastern the tall grass prairie in north america all these places needed regular burning and if you don't burn over maybe as much as four or five or six years, uh, woody vegetation takes over. So they had to be burned you know, every two or three years. And the only way to get that is, is with people. But that's also a way of saying that there was a lot of carbon that could have been stored that wasn't. Not because we went in and cleared forests, but we prevented them from establishing at, at density. And when fire was removed, they've come back. And now it's very difficult uh, to get rid of them sometimes. 
So just what I think of as an aboriginal economy of fire by control over ignition can have huge influence, uh, but it's working within the system. And then what I think of as the agricultural turn, we began creating more fuels where nature wouldn't have. We can do it outside of the season. Uh, we can uh, slash, kill, dry out, and then burn. Again, out of season, uh, we can drain areas uh, expose them uh, to fire that w they wouldn't have except under really extreme drought. And so we can begin expanding the domain of fire and we can, in a sense, begin recoding the pulses and patches by which it occurs in the landscape. And we've done this, you know, essentially every place that could burn, we've taken fire to. And we've taken fire to places that don't burn, like Greenland and mm -hmm. uh, Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And it's fire that even takes us off planet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you see these you know, spacecraft lifting off, they're doing it on an enormous plume of fire. So we, we have really, we've made a kind of mutual assistance pact with fire very early on. In a sense, we would expand the opportunities for fire. At the same time, fire would allow us to occupy and make habitable many, many places. But even so, there are limits. You know, you can't, slash and burn too often or too extensively without the system starting to run down and then it can no longer function. So there are all kinds of ecological checks and balances. You can't, you can't burn when there's snow on the ground uh, or if it's, you know, soaked in fog, uh, not going to burn very well. So there are all kinds of ecological limits. And for much of our existence, our quest for fire was a quest for more stuff to burn. And that, then that changes, and it changes when we begin burning, going from burning living landscapes to burning what I call lithic landscapes, that is fossil fuels. And the first big one was, of course, coal, and then oil, uh, and others follow uh, beyond. And that that gave us essentially unbounded firepower. And we don't see it as fire often, uh, but we, it is. We're just not burning it in a visible, in the same visible way that it was before, uh, and that has also allowed us to restructure the places we live and the landscapes we live in. So generally, we have used that power to remove the old kinds of fires. So we we don't have a lot of working fires in our houses anymore. We would have heated it, we would have cooked, we would have illuminated, even entertained. There would have been fire. There would have been fire all the time. I mean, I can even remember in Phoenix where I grew up, you'd go out in the spring and burn off your Bermuda lawn. <laughs> it took a few minutes and then, you know, and then it's, it's over with and it's ready for the rains to come and uh, the lawn to come back. Well, you can't do that anymore. So the alternative, and this shows in a certain sense the power, but also the goofy paradox uh, of going to a fossil fuel alternative uh, with sort of mindlessly. So now instead of burning it, I rent a dethatcher, which runs, runs gas. And then uh, I have to rake up all of the, the dead grass uh, and I have to put it in plastic bags, and then I take it out to the street, where a, a large truck, burning more fossil fuels, picks it up, drives it to a landfill, dumps it, where it decomposes to methane. <laughs> but there's no flame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. well, when you put it like that, so, you know, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah. But that's in a sense what we've done. And so we have used that new kind of fossil power, uh, which in many ways is unbounded, uh, to, to replace over, over immense landscapes. And this has been hugely destructive ecologically. And this takes place quite apart from climate change. 